And welcome to Community Life Church on this beautiful, freezing Sunday morning. Everybody's coming in here like there's snow on the ground outside. Um, it, it's cold outside. Here in Gulf Breeze, it was in the low 30s. Um, and so Tammy this morning went out to the car and came back in and she said, Scott, do you have a window scraper? I said, no, if you have one of those, then you have to expect, no, I don't. So she worked it out. I gave her a spatula and she went out there and figured it out. I, I don't know. I should have probably videoed that. But, but I do want to welcome you and say good morning to you on this Sunday between Christmas and New Year's. This is kind of an interesting uh, morning as we gather here in person and gather online. I um, just so appreciate you being here today. My name is Scott Verano. I'm the lead pastor here at Community Life, and it is an honor to have you here with us today. Um, uh, two quick announcements. Number one, we'll be having communion at the end of this service to kind of close out the year, and so Jim Bell will be leading us in that. And then also, number two, um, we will be, the service times are changing a little bit as we get into the new year, but it's only one service that's impacted, and it's that last service. Um, it's been 1045. We were trying to give extra time for people to get in and out of the building. We're sliding that back to 1030 to the original time that it was because we're finding that we have plenty of time. So uh, it just works better to get things moving that way. Um, so we're going to be at, at 8, 9, and 1030 uh, going into, into New Year. So are you guys ready for a great Sunday? All right. Well, I'd like to invite you, if you will, to go ahead and stand. And um, let's go ahead and join our hearts together as we pray the Lord's Prayer. You all do that with me? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this cool, crisp morning, walking out the door, it was, it, you instantly knew that you were alive <laughs> when you felt that cold air. And uh, God, we're just appreciative of another day and another opportunity to, to worship you, to spend time praying and, and uh, pondering and processing through what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. And, and God, this morning, as, as we close out this year, um, I'll just start by saying I'm grateful God, for the, for the many things we've been able to experience, even some of the difficult moments that we've walked through. Lord, you've helped to shape and mold our lives and get us to this place to where we have a deeper appreciation and a deeper understanding of your grace, of your mercy, and in many instances of your eternity. And, and so God, just, just help us to frame that in our hearts as we lean into 2021 um, with the expectation of a God that will continue to lead and guide and, and take us to whatever is next. Lord, and so we just apply ourselves to you today. We love you, we trust you, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray, amen. So glad you're joining us this morning. We're just gonna invite you to sing along and worship with us on this song. is calling Have you come to the end of yourself Do you search for a drink from the well Jesus is calling Oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Sing it with me. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes, a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come 
are always open and ready and willing for acceptance and grace and love. God, we are so, we just forget so often uh, how much that you love us and that that forgiveness is waiting always right there. And so we thank you for that. We fall into that because you came. Lord, even during this season as we remembered your birth, Lord, there was a purpose that you came that you would die on a cross for us and for our sins. And so we just lean into that. We cast all of our burdens, all of our cares before you uh, this morning. We love you. We need you. And we thank you for this service. Be with us as we continue and bless Jim Bell as he delivers the message this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you for singing. All right, who turned off the heat? I saw, I think it was yesterday, I saw something on the, I guess it was on the internet that said that it was warmer in Portland, Maine than it was here. It is 2020, so that doesn't, you know, <laughs> this, year, this year needs to go by quickly. Because I'm ready to get back to regular temperatures here, and hopefully, I, I think in another few days, we should be back in the 60s, so. So if you're online and you're in Portland, Maine right now, uh, I hope you get some warmer temperatures too. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why do we accept the Scriptures as the Word of God? And do we accept those Scriptures as the authority 
as we live our lives day to day. Because authority is always the ultimate question. Who are you following? In any issue that we would talk about or discuss, you got to resolve it on the basis of authority. Someone, something in control. You know, we, uh, we like to sit back and, and think about, you know, it would be really, really great if we could set everyone else's opinion aside and just make all the decisions based upon what we know and what we want to do. You know, you, I want to come to my own conclusions. We, we hear that sometimes when we talk to people. We don't want anyone else to influence us. But you know what? You can't live your life that way. You, you're kidding yourself. You, just, you can talk it all you want, but you can't pull it off. Because there's no way by which we could possibly spend all the time necessary for us to study all the different subjects that, we get in, that, that come in front of us in order to make any type of decision. Think about it. You know, you, you get in the car and you drive to a town. You've never been there before, but you're looking for a certain address. And what you do is you go into that town and since you can't find it, you ask, you call someone over and you ask a question. Where can I find or where, how do I get to see? And then whatever it is you're looking for. And how many times when you do that, you get the directions and you accept them instantly that they have authority over you because they live there. They know the area. So we actually take authority from people we don't even know because we assume that they have some knowledge or they have some background that we don't have. So the final issue is always is, what authority do you have? Now, a Christian resolves the puzzles and riddles and the difficult questions of life on the basis of only one thing, and that is the Word of God. It's the Holy Scriptures. No, the final right we have as human beings is to choose. We have the right to choose. Life is all about choices, and we can choose the authority we are going to obey. Because you have to obey some authority. You have to submit to some master, if you will. In the Christian community, the Bible, both the Old Testament, the New Testament, it's the revelation of the mind of God. It's God speaking to us. It's his special revelation to the, to the people. What it says in Scripture is final. Because Scripture is superseded by no other authority. It's challenged by nothing else. It is unquestionable because it is the living word of God himself speaking. It is the ultimate authority of your life and my life as well. Now, that of course will raise questions. Someone may say, well, that's fine for for you Christians who happen to believe that, but how do you really know? How do you really know that the Bible is the Word of God? Maybe the most convincing argument that can be given is the fact that here in the Bible you find revealed about life certain truths which, you are, which are essential to anyone if you're going to live life as it was intended and as, we, as it was purposed to be lived. And you're not going to find those rules or those guidelines anywhere else. There are certain essential elements that, that people must know if they are going to handle life properly. And you can go to a library, you can go to a university, you can go a lot of different places, but you're not going to find it there. You're only going to find it in the Bible. You can look into all the research being done in science and and throughout the world, you can take into all the wisdom of the world's philosophers, and, and you're never going to find the truths that are hidden in the Holy Scriptures. This is what marks 
the Bible as God's book. It's the essential book on life itself. If you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in uh, 2 Corinthians. I want you to open your Bible if you got it there. And the second chapter, and I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's not a long one, but, but listen to how this applies. And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, and this is the Apostle Paul writing, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom, a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, What no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. These are the things God has revealed to us by His Spirit. The Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. The person without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgments about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct Him? But we have the mind of Christ." So he says that among the mature, as he calls it, the mature, we speak or we impart a hidden secret wisdom, if you will, which none of the rulers of this age know anything about. They're clueless about the whole thing. And he refers to the rulers of the age, he refers to um, uh, the ideas that are coming down through the culture and the society you live in. But he's not really talking strictly about governmental authorities. A lot of times that's what we read that to mean. It's, it's not necessarily just talking about governmental authorities. He's talking about the leaders of human thought. So he's talking about you know, the philosophers of the days. He's talking about the statesmen, the diplomats, you know, the people who mold and shape opinion, world opinion. So he's talking about poets. He's talking about philosophers, politicians. You name it. Those who lead people in every realm of life. And about those people, he says, they do not know the secrets of God. They don't know them. And because they don't know them, they make the most atrocious mistakes and blunders. They're constantly you know, stepping on their foot. They injure and damage untold numbers of people. But Paul says that God has revealed these secrets to us. And they're revealed to us by His Spirit. They're given to those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Those who possess the Holy Spirit. They can hear and understand these secrets or these mysteries of God. 
You know, it's these same things which later on in, in 1 Corinthians he refers to as the mysteries of God. Mysteries of God. Well, you know, one of the things I've noticed more and more as I've gone through this Bible is how often Paul specifically refers to mysteries of God, secrets of God. The word mystery appears like 26 times in the Bible, and 20 of those times are in the epistles. They're in the letters that, that Paul has written. So if you go to, to chapter 4 of Corinthians, he says this, This then is how you ought to regard us, as servants of Christ, and as those entrusted with the, here it is again, the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Christians, you, me, are said to be stewards of the mysteries of God. That makes us the caretakers, if you will, the custodians of God's secrets. We're the ones that dispense them to the world that needs to hear them. And we don't hold on to these things for ourselves and just say, well, I'm just going to wrap myself in my little cocoon. But instead, we are to practice them. We are to distribute them, distribute them to, to a world out there that's waiting it because it's falling apart. And it's falling apart for one reason. It just doesn't understand how life really does is supposed to work. It's not, we don't know how to live life the way God has taught us to live. That's what the world sees. Now, obviously, you and I know that Christians struggle a great deal in our lives. We are not ex excluded from that. So the knowledge of these secrets doesn't remove you and I from the conflict. It doesn't get us out of the battle at all. You can be confronted with puzzling and baffling and troublesome experiences that I'll tell you what, you don't even have the inkling of an answer to. These secrets do not exempt us, but one thing they do, they enable us, they give us the capability for us to find the solutions and handle the circumstances which come into our lives. Can't avoid them, but we are now going to be able to handle them, manage them, make sense of them. I think we should all be concerned at how many Christians exposed to the truth of God, are still unable to handle life as life is thrown at them. There is way too many Christians that just don't put this into action. The poet T.S. Eliot, he described life this way. All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. And all our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearer to death no nearer to God. Where is the life that we have lost in living? It is possible, is it not, to lose life while you are living it because you do not know the hidden wisdom, the secrets, the mysteries of God. Mysteries in scriptures are not whodunits. You know, we, we think the word mystery and all of a sudden we're, we're thinking of Agatha, Agatha Christie and, and a lot of the other uh, great mystery writers and, you know, normally it's what, the butler that did it. You know, that's what, that's what we normally think about a mystery. We, we, we think about whodunits. But these are not insolvable problems, strange and mysterious. They're not riddles that no one can figure out. Yes, they are secrets. There are mysteries that are hidden from the general public, but they are made available to anyone who would call upon the name of Jesus Christ and is willing to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the greatest secrets scattered throughout the Scriptures, I don't care whether you're in Genesis all the way to Revelation, one of the greatest secrets is what you find referred to repeatedly as the mystery of the kingdom of God. That expression happens over and over. The secret government, if you will, on earth. Because in the midst of what we see in the world around us, with nature and people and books and trees and lakes and rivers and houses and all the things that are visible to us, 
right in the middle of all of that and permeating all of that, working within all of that and controlling everything is a secret invisible kingdom. We read about this in Scripture. It's the kingdom of God. God is in control of history. God is governing in human affairs. God is the creator who created absolutely everything that you can sense with your five senses. Now, I think men and women generally do not want to think of God as being present necessarily. Yet without this knowledge of the kingdom of God and God's control of human events, your, your, your events, my events, and so forth, even to their most intimate details, life becomes meaningless, becomes empty, it becomes devoid of purpose when you separate the life you live from the secret mystery of God's kingdom. You know, we sometimes feel worthless, sometimes useless. And the older we get, the less reason sometimes people have for living. So if you want purpose in your life, you've got to begin by recognizing something. And that's the fact that this great mystery that the Scriptures talks about over and over and over, this secret kingdom, if you will, only then are things going to begin to fall into place and make sense for you. You know, that despair has spread throughout the world. In our day especially, men and women deny of this special kingdom. They deny it. But in denying it, they also find that they're constantly falling apart at the seams because they have no meaning, they have no purpose, in effect, they have no reason to exist. You know, the great high priest of humanism, if you want to call him that, is a man, a man by the name of Bertrand Russell, a British philosopher. He wrote this some years ago. Brief, powerless is man's life. On him and all his race, the slow, sure doom falls pitiless and dark, blind to good and evil, reckless to destruction, omnipotent matter rolls on its relentless way. For man, condemned today to lose his dearest tomorrow, himself to pass through the gates of darkness, it remains only to cherish, ere yet the blow falls, the lofty thoughts that ennoble his little day. What a life of the party Bertrand Russell must have been. Goodness gracious. And yet that is all you can see in the universe. The universe is sort of shutting down. It's one thing to talk about the kingdom of God at church, and we do it all the time. But what about tomorrow when you're not here? Maybe you're at work or if you're in your home, or you're at the store, or you're shopping, or maybe you're at a friend's house or a neighbor's house. The question is, do you see God's ruling hand there? In those locations, do you grasp his sense of, of, of what's going on with how he sees the world? Do you see his grasp of human events and his bringing about of his purposes and through the tears and the darkness and the sorrow? Do you see how he's still working through that? Because that's what makes the difference between meaning and meaningless in life. Because we're all living with all those issues. Then there's what Paul calls in 2 Thessalonians, he calls it the secret power of lawlessness. Secret power of lawlessness. And probably we all struggle with this one in some way, shape, form, because maybe you're like me. Maybe you've sometimes asked this question. Why did this happen to me? Whatever that event happens, happened to be, but, but why did it happen to me? Why do I have to go through this, this ugly experience? I didn't wish that upon myself. Why should 
injustice prevail? Why do wars continue with their senseless and ceaseless destruction time after time after time? Why is it we still struggling with the very same problems that the Romans struggled with in the days of Julius Caesar? We're going back over two millennia. Why are we still having the same problems? We haven't learned, basically, a thing more than they did about how to solve these problems. And I don't care how many wise philosophers and statesmen and diplomats and and movers and shakers of society that you want to get, get involved. The secret we get from the Bible is that there is a mystery or secret of lawlessness. Because there is an evil with a name. It's called Satan. The Bible calls him the great prince of a great kingdom of darkness. A kingdom of millions of beings very much like himself who are in lockstep against the government and the wishes and the purposes of God Almighty. They are intent on wrecking, messing up, smashing all the love born plans of God for the human race. They want to get rid of them all. And they're very good at doing it. They're very good, and they know how to do it. Because you're never going to understand life, and you're never going to understand the conflicts you have in your home between you and your spouse or your children and your parents or with your neighbors or with your co-workers or with anyone else until you have understood this secret that Paul talks about, this mystery of lawlessness. You've never been able to do anything effective about it. Because you're going to find, constantly find yourself treating symptoms. Treating the symptoms which, which keep reappearing time after time after time again. And you're going to do that because unless you understand how to use the weapons that are described by Paul, such as you find in the sixth chapter of Ephesians, where he talks about the full armament, put on the full armament of God, you've got to put that armament on. Because only then can you really target the real source of trouble. Exactly parallel with that is what Paul calls the mystery of godliness. Godliness. The mystery of godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, says this. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. He appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. You can never escape the struggles of life. If you, if, if you have, let, let me know, because I really would like to talk to you about that. But you never ex- escape these struggles, but you can win the battle. You don't have to be defeated. You don't have to be torn apart. You don't have to be discouraged. You don't have to be bored. You don't have to be jealous. You don't have to be anxious or envious or fretful. You can win the battle by the secret secret of godliness, which is called the mystery of the gospel, the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the church. You know, the real practical, radical principle of all this is that God intends to live within men and women. That's the radical principle about all this hinges. Mankind is to be the dwelling place of God himself. And through the cross and through the resurrection, God has set aside man's guilt, He's provided for mankind's weakness. He's given us the keys on how to handle life through the power and the activity of God himself living in you. 
That's the mystery of godliness. And it's really the greatest secret that the world has ever heard of. God Almighty, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, indwells the heart of every believer. That's a secret that you and I know, but it's a secret that the world doesn't want to accept. This secret, or this mystery, is waiting for Christians to demonstrate it so that when you get upset or you get anxious, you get attacked, things start to fall apart so that you don't react as a non-Christian. You don't act as the world would in that situation. Because I'll tell you what, the world is utterly and absolutely amazed that you don't retaliate or you don't spill out a few dozen very, very choice words in return to something unpleasant that's taking place in your life. You don't strike back, you don't get even. The world is amazed when you do that. The problem is that many, 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 many Christians haven't yet learned this mystery of godliness. No, no, they know. Well, they know it intellectually. They know it up here because they've heard it. You can't get in through the Gospels without, and then they're talking about what Paul writes about in all his letters, without getting some understanding of what that's all about. They know it intellectually. But the problem is most people, many, many Christians, haven't committed their lives to it. It stayed here. Yet that is what really changes life. And that's what God calls us over and over to learn. Because it's the answer to guilt. How many of you, the alarm goes off in the morning, how many of you get up in the morning, the first thing, you sense a piece of guilt. You feel some, some sense of guilt about something you didn't do yesterday, but you should have. And you know you should have. But you know, it wasn't part of your agenda. It wasn't part of your schedule that day. Or or maybe you get up and the first thing you think about is something wrong that you did the night before. So the big question is, how do you handle that? Do you know how to handle that? Do you know how to divest yourself of that sense of guilt? Do you know how to get rid of that sense of inadequacy you feel whenever you are challenged with something that you know is way too big for you to handle on your own? Do you know how to avail yourself of God's power to meet whatever challenge comes into your life? Now there's another secret or mystery that's found also in 1 Corinthians. And it's in the 15th chapter. Verses 51 and 52, Paul says this, Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. There's a lot of different scripture that you can find, passages in in the Bible that speak of that change of what God is going to do in the future. In both 2 Corinthians and Romans, Paul says this. He says, for our light and momentary troubles, light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Then he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Finally, we stand before the mystery of God Himself. We stand before this this mighty being, this this wonderful God, this, this three persons, yet one God, whose ways are so different than our ways. His thoughts are so much higher than ours. A God who teaches us things such as you've got to lose life in order that you might gain life. 
that if you're going to live, we have to die. That if we're going to reign, we must become a servant of others. That if you're going to become rich, you must accept poverty and loss. No wonder Paul says, for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. You know, the amazing thing that should just grip us, just absolutely hold on to us, is that each of us has been given these secrets. We've been given these mysteries of God. And you and I are stewards of these mysteries. They've been given to us so that we might first understand and then we are to begin to live our lives accordingly so that we can demonstrate to others and others may see in action. And when they see in action, lives change, untold lives being changed. Do you have any idea how dark this world would be? Do you have any idea how completely hopeless life would be without the slightest bit of relief were it not for the dissemination of these secrets of God through the centuries by Christians just like us? Do you realize how dark the world would be? I think it's a great challenge here for all of us, you and me as well, to be honest with ourselves and ask ourselves a very, very important question. How faithful of a steward am I of these great secrets, these great mysteries, the way life is absolutely supposed to live and work? Because these are the riches that God has entrusted to you and to me. And we're not to just hang on to them. We're just not to have hidden head knowledge. We are to take them and to demonstrate them to the world. That's what Jesus did over and over and over. His entire life was a demonstration of the secrets and mysteries of the kingdom of God. We are to carry on. And we become little Christ, as Martin Luther would call us to go out and demonstrate to a world that has been falling apart forever and ever and ever because people do not understand, do not know, and have no interest in these secrets and mysteries. Yet we know they are life itself. So the question that we've, we have to wrestle with is, how am I demonstrating these mysteries and secrets to a world that doesn't have a clue? Do you bow your heads with me? Lord, we thank you for never giving up on us. We thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, there's so much that we need to, 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 to understand and to be guided on. And Lord, all that authority and all that truth is in your word. So Lord, let us just dive deep into these passages, to understand who you are, to understand how life works. And when we look back at, at human history, we, we see that time after time after time again, life does not work when we are trying to do it on our own. And that real change takes place when men and women like us demonstrate what the kingdom of God is all about. So Lord, that's my prayer today, that that we might take what we've learned and start applying it to wherever you take us. We all have divine appointments. Lord, make sure that we understand that it is not our agenda, it is not our time planner, it is yours. And that everything that we do might bring glory to you and your Son. And it's in his name that we pray this all. Amen. On the night in which he was betrayed, Jesus performed a miraculous identification with us. And as we close this tumultuous year of 2020, it's only fitting that we also take this communion 
of the bread and the grape juice and identify with the sacrifice. Because as Jesus said, when you take these in, we become one. So if you've got your wafer, Jesus said that this is my body. It was broken for you. Take and eat. And after they had done that, he picked up the goblet and he held it up and he says, this is my blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. We remember. Lord, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for the privilege of identifying with us, of living in us, your Holy Spirit alive as our teacher, as our guide, as our counselor, as our friend. Lord, as we face this new year, we don't face it alone. We face it knowing that we are yours, that we are in the palm of your hand, that nothing can snatch us away. So we have the freedom to live life to the full because we know the secrets, we know the mysteries of your kingdom. And we thank you and praise you. Amen. Have a great day today and stay warm.